By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to round number four of the Paladins of the North Cup. So, I mean, this was just a great event and it's so cool to make these videos looking back at this. And I'm really looking forward to this matchup because we have Brother Stebo taking on D. Both of these players are really, really good, usually getting top eights at tournaments, always having good results. Uh, Brother Stebo is playing a deck that I've called Bolt and Friends. Uh, it's uh, white, it's blue, it's red, it's got that famous black splash for Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. It's just there's a lot of direct damage in there, a lot of really cool cards. It's When you see it, you know, because I'm going to do a deck deck in a moment, when you see it, you'll know what I mean by that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, deck to look at. And then uh, he's playing against D, and he's playing with core set only, so his deck is completely alpha beta. And he's also playing with the same colors as his opponent Stebo, he's also playing with white, blue, red, and has also that famous black splash for Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. So I think this could be a thriller of a match. I'm really looking forward to look at this. Now before we jump into the game itself, we're first going to do the deck decks. Now if you want to skip the deck decks or just skip this whole intro altogether, um, the easiest way to do that is by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps is marked MTG Games. If you click on there, that will take you straight to the action. And here we are going to continue with the deck deck and I'm going to start with the deck of Brother Stebo, Bolt and Friends. And here we see the deck of Brother Stebo. So, I mean, this is one of those decks that there is, there is, every card has a purpose. It's a very competitive deck. I would say it's definitely a tier one deck. Now, the first thing you probably notice are all the, the miscuts. I guess you call the miscuts on those uh, print sheets. So, I mean, look at those Mishra's Factories, also those revised uh, Serendips. It's just really, really cool. I mean, he's got a he's got a beautiful collection. Also, look at the altered mind twist. That's just fantastic. Um, but when we look at basically, oh, the brain geyser. By the way, look at that brain geyser. Wow, that's phenomenal. And he's not playing the brain geyser main, so he's actually putting it in the sideboard. But wow, I really love the art on, on that. I would love to own that. Um, anyway, um, I'm a little bit drooling over your cards here, uh, Stevo, I'm sorry. When we look at what the deck wants to do, the first thing I notice is that it has a lot of direct damage. I think this is really a competitive deck. Three Psy Blasts, four Lightning Bolts, four Chain Lightning. So there's still a lot of aggression. And he's combining that aggression with the cheap uh, creatures so that they can come out early. So we see Savannah Lions, but we also see that really cool playset of uh, Serendip Jins. So he can, I mean, he can all start playing those, sorry, Surrender Befreets, of course. Um, so that's a 3-4 flyer. Um, he, you know, he can he can start playing that out really, really aggressively. He can deal a lot of early damage with his deck. I mean, this deck has, like, competitiveness written all over it. Like, I don't, every card here is a hit, right? I don't see a single card where he's kind of put his uh, um, foot off of the gas pedal. It's all, like, fuel. He wants to... To get there as quickly as possible he's gonna probably burn d out he's gonna you know play his creatures he, he doesn't have to do a lot of combat damage with this deck because you've got so much direct damage going on on top of that you've got your you know white control cards he's got his disenchants i believe i only see oh actually don't see a source i see one armageddon so it's quite interesting and i actually kind of agree here with stebo not to go for swords to plowshares main your first instinct is to play your swords to plowshares main but the things with Swords to Plowshares, yes, it's fantastic removal. I mean, of course, your best creature removal probably in, in, in old school. But you are giving your opponent life with Swords to Plowshares. And that can be kind of counterproductive, especially when you look at the deck here of Stebo. Stebo wants to get there as quickly as possible, whereas Swords will probably give his opponent an extra turn. So it will actually slow him down. And he's going to do most of the damage with direct damage anyway. So he doesn't really care about you know not being able to to hit with savannah lines he can be patient and can just wait on top of that most creatures in old school can be kind of um destroyed with the weapons that he already has like cyblast is great against sarah angel you know he's got the bolts he's got the chains against the smaller stuff so yeah you know things are, are looking pretty good i would say this deck is is super super competitive and i also like all the draw sevens in the deck because with this deck you can kind of run out of cards quite quickly so i think time twister and um 
also um, Wheel of Fortune are really good in here. So that's why I'm a little bit surprised that Brain Geyser isn't in the main. On the other hand, that's not his his main game plan, right? To go kind of mid-range and then refill his hand with Brain Geyser. It's maybe a little bit too slow and it's also a double blue. So maybe that's part of his reasoning as well to put that into the sideboard instead of in the main board. Because if you look at this deck, the only cards that have a double color casting cost are actually the Mana Drain and the one counter spell. So it's, it's a super lean build. Um, and I'm looking forward to see the next year to see if it's really as good as I think it is because I think it's super good Anyway, this is the deck of Stebo. Now. Let's take a look at the deck of his opponent D And here we see the deck of D and what a deck it is So I've called it core obviously because he's only playing with core sets just alpha and beta and I mean this collection of D is insane I mean, both of these players have insane collections and I mean, I really like it that D is a purist in that sense that he's like, I just want to play with my corset collection. I love corset. And he's been playing this deck uh, more often. We've seen it on the channel before as well. So if you're a regular uh, visitor and a viewer of Timmy Talks videos, you'll probably recognize this deck. And, you know, I think if you already have a great player and then that great player decides to play with the same deck over and over and over again, that deck really gets better than you may think it is. Like if I would play with this deck, don't get me wrong, it's a super good deck, but if I would play with this deck, I wouldn't get the results that D is getting with this deck. Like he's just, he's and a super player and he's been playing with this deck for a long time. Because, you know, just think about it. He's saying, I'm not going to use any cards from the Four Horsemen set. And he has cards from those sets, believe me. But he's saying, I'm not going to play, uh, you know, Mishra's Factory. I'm not going to play Loa. I'm not going to play Chain Lightning like we see in a deck of, of Brother Stebo. So he's making different choices. The nice thing is when you do that, you're opening up slots for your deck. So you, you get more creative, I feel. And 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 also, you're, you're focusing more on, okay, what is actually magic intentionally all about in those alpha beta sets. I also find that quite interesting, right? Because those were the first cards ever printed, right? After that, you got all the expansions with cards that worked really well and cards that worked really bad and cards that were just overpowered. Well, yet, of course, overpowered cards in the core set. I mean, Ancestral Regal, duh. Uh, but I, I hope you know what I mean, right? It's kind of nice to kind of stick to that core of magic. Uh, now, when we're looking at this deck, I mean, it's super good. One of the things I like about it is the creature base. I think, you know, you've got Force of an Alliance to deal early damage. Then that's followed up by your Setch Troll, which is three mana to cast, but actually you don't cast it before you have access to four mana because you also want to always want to have a black mana open for regeneration purposes. So keep that in mind when you want to play with the Setch Troll. It's, I know it's only three to cast, but then you're taking a risk. So usually you wait until you have four mana. So the creature is slightly slower than you may think it is. Um, and then you have the three Sarah Angels, beautiful, of course. And then there's that beast, the Sheevan Dragon. And I, I just hope the, that we can see the Sheevan making an appearance in this matchup. Um, we do see some similarities here in the decks as well, right? Both players are playing with a lot of direct damage. D is playing with four Bolts and four Psyblasts, so also a lot of direct damage. Both players are not playing Swords to Plowshares main, kind of indicating that they're both uh, have very aggressive intentions. Again, like I said, in the deck deck of Brother Stebo, Swords to Plowshares can also work against you. It can be counterproductive because you're giving your opponent an extra, sometimes an extra turn because of the life gain. Of course, Swords is still a great, great piece of creature removal. And it's understandable here in the sideboard that if your opponent is playing with too big of a creatures or regeneration creatures, then you can start boarding in your Swords to Plowshares instead of maybe some of your direct damage. So that's an also always an option. We also see that both players have opted for one Armageddon right and that one armageddon can be absolutely a game changer right if you're ahead on board your time your armageddon right you can just win the game because of that one armageddon and you may think okay it's only one armageddon in the deck but remember both players are playing with the demonic tutor both players are playing with draw seven spells so you know there is a slightly bigger chance of finding that one card than you would have in any other regular deck um, I'm also liking the inclusion of the two power sync, by the way. I think a well-timed power sync can be great because you're forcing your opponent to tap out, especially when you do it in your opponent's turn. You counter something from your opponent. You're forcing him to tap out. And then when it's your turn, you know, okay, I've got the world. I've got this. My opponent cannot cast any instance, no counter spells to worry about, no disenchants to worry about, no swords to worry about, no lightning bolts to worry about. So it really kind of opens up this momentum for you. So a well-timed power sync can do that. And you can see here that um, D has chosen power sync over counterspell. He's chosen it over mana drain. Well, of course, he doesn't want to play mana drain because it's not in the core set. 
But still, you know, he's choosing PowerSync over that. I think part of that decision as well is that PowerSync, of course, only one blue and X, where, you know, a counterspell is two blue, which is slightly harder to kind of get for this deck. If you look at the blue cards, all the blue cards only require one blue to cast except for the Brain Geyser. So he's really probably looked at that casting cost and thought, okay, I don't want to have a lot of double blues in there. And, and in Counterspell, you just don't have two blue all the time. And, and when you have a worthless Counterspell in hand, it just feels bad. So then you probably would rather have a Power Sync. I do think that Power Sync, if you play with it, you do need you know, all the Moxin and stuff. And the good news is D has access to all the Moxin and stuff. So <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. Um, looking at the sideboard, by the way, I do wonder how both players are going to sideboard. Maybe it'll be a Blue Blast, Red Blast war after that first game. It's going to be super interesting because both players are playing similar colors. So the sideboard is, is probably going to be uh, there are going to be some similarities there as well. Okay, this is the deck of D. We've looked at the deck of Stebo, so that means we're ready. Let's go to round number four of the Pelons of the North Cup 2022. Game number one, here we go. So on the right side, we have Dion, and look at that. He's taking a mulligan, so he's playing with the Corset deck. And on the left side, we have Brother Stebo playing Bolt and Friends. So both players playing white, blue, red, and a little bit of a black splash. So they play similar colors. Let's see what Dion can do here. Casting a Volcanic Island <laughs> into an Ancestral Recall, doing it straight away. Probably indicating that he's got some Moxin in hand to play out because you don't really want to go to the discard. There we go, Mox Ruby and a pass turn. So seven in hand here for Dion. So that's a pretty good opening for him. Let's see what his opponent can do here. There is a Tundra. Are we going to see a Savannah Lines turn one? Both players playing a full playset of Savannah Lines. Let's see what he can do here. Ooh, there's a Black Lotus. Look at that, very aggressively playing a Surrender Efreet. This is a nice start. Also, of course, knowing that Dion cannot counter yet. So it's a great moment here for Stebo to put some pressure on the board. And remember, both players are not playing with Swords to Plowshares main. So Dion kind of needs a Psychic, uh, sorry, a Psionic Blast here to get rid of that Surrender Befreet, and he's just passing turn. There's a damage here for Stebo, gonna go to 19 because of his own Efreet, of course, but he can swing in for three, and he's gonna put D on 17. So good business here for Brother Stebo. And another blue source on board, he can just pass turn. Remember, he doesn't play with a lot of counter magic, though. He's got one mana drain and one counter spell, so he's choosing the more aggressive route here by casting that Savannah Lines. I am expecting a Bolt here, to be honest. There we see a bolt on the lions. But you know, still then it's eating up a bolt. That's not too bad. And let's see what uh, Dion is going to do. Another dual land for him. I mean, he could cast, for example, a Setch Troll. Next turn he can cast a Sarah Angel. Obviously, if he would have had a Side Blast, he would have uh, cast it already, I think. Tapping four, what are we gonna get? Hard to see. Oh, there's a Brain Geyser. It was hard to see because of the glare, but now we can see it was a Brain Geyser for two. And I think if you're Stebo, it, it, this doesn't feel too bad, you know? If Dion's kind of forced to now cast his Brain Geyser, because you don't really want to cast a Brain Geyser for two. You want to wait later on in the match. But of course, if you're behind on board, you've got to force something, and Dion is probably looking for that side blast to take care of the Surrender Pafrit. Surrender Pafrit can swing in now, so it's going to deal three more points of damage at six in total already. There is a Mistress Factory, one of those beautiful miscut cards in the deck here of Stebo. So next turn, he could consider attacking with the Factory. Of course, that's a bit of a risk playing against a player with access to Bolts and Disenchants. So he's probably, I don't think he's gonna attack with it, but we'll just have to see. There's land number five. Are we gonna see a Sarah Angel here? Yep, I think we're going to see a Sarah Angel. There is a Sarah Angel, and he's holding it like, are you allowing it? Are you allowing it? And remember, these players, of course, haven't seen each other's deck lists. So when you see blue mana and you see two blue open, you think, okay, he's probably playing with four counter spells. But we know that that's not the case. He's just playing one counter spell, one mana drain. And, ooh, he's kind of changing. Does he want to play a side blast here on end step? I think that would be a good decision because then he can also swing in. We just gonna tap two though, he's gonna disenchant the Mox. Interesting, does it mean that he's got a draw seven in hand, for example, that he wants to start emptying his hand now? 
All these little telltales, these signs are quite interesting. We do see some little zoom issues on the camera here, by the way. It's quite annoying, but let's hope it's going to stop. There we see an attack. And of course, if he's going to block it, he's basically saying, okay, if you've got, for example, a bolt, it's fine. So there we see the block. But of course, Stebo doesn't have any rat mana yet. So the surrender is going to die. Does he have a balance in hand, perhaps? That could be the case as well. Emptying the hand, letting his creature die, that usually indicates a balance. He's got less lands as well than De Young. Ooh, now they're on even footing with the lance. Going to take a damage from his City of Brass. Are we now going to see the bolt? Okay, we're going to see a chain, but it's the same idea. So one of the things that's... Imp Ooh, he's not going to play it on the Angel. Oh, -ho, and now he's going to play the balance. So he did have a balance in hand. Quite interesting. Look at that. Stebo only with one card in hand remaining. This is really tough for Dion. And this must be nice for Stebo when you see your opponent tapping out. You know you can do all those little things. You don't have to worry about any counter magic. So Dion losing a lot of cards here and losing a creature. This is just a great, great balance by, uh, by Brother Stebo. And there is a pass turn. And Dion here drawing a card. So he's on 11 at the moment and just passing turn. And now we can, ooh, yep, Loa is not going to be very relevant, but he's going to attack. I think one of the reasons he's doing this is because he's thinking, I've got enough mana anyway, and Dion only has two cards in hand. What if he cannot take care of the factory? Then he can start, like, dealing this, these points of damage because he's, he is on 11, which is quite low. There we see his Havana line on the side of D and just a pass turn here. There's the attack, Stebo dropping to 14. There is another line, so there's some pressure. And now it's up to Stebo to see, can I do something against this? Because that means four damage per turn on the board. That is an issue here. Using a City of Brass, taking a damage, dropping to 13. That is a, I believe, a Mind Twist. There we see, ooh, a Side Blast on a life total of Stebo. Oof. Kind of backfired on Brother Stebo there. Playing his Mox Ruby and a pass. He's on nine now. He's probably going to take four more. He's going to drop to five. I mean, he's got two turns if he's lucky. And then he cannot use his City of Brass anymore. You really don't want to use your City at this point. Because it'll drop to four. That means you're dead next turn. Stebo going through the motions. Trying to find a way out of this. I mean, that balance was fantastic. But I feel that after that, he kind of couldn't find the right cards. And of course, Dion could find those uh, those Savannah lines, which were just great. And of course, the disenchant against the factory. There we see a Cyblast. Yeah, and this is of course the downside of Cyblast because yes, you kill a creature, but you also take two damage. It feels so bad to play a Cyblast on the Savannah lines. You don't want to do that. Now he's on one. Are we going to see a finish by D? Remember, he is playing with four bolts. We're not seeing it though. And, yep, that's it. Stebo is saying, I don't have the cards that I need here. You've got this one. So that means Dion has game number one. So both of these players are going to go into their sideboards. And we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two here about to start. Brother Stebo on the play, of course, after losing in that first game. And a D going through his cards. Both players keeping their hands. There is a Tundra and a Mox Ruby. And a time walk. Okay, that's a pretty explosive start. So he's getting ahead here. One of the things I like about time walk is that you also get ahead in lands, right? It's also a tempo play. So he's going to have that extra land drop now. Making it a Mishra's Factory and casting a Chaos Orb. So potentially he could use the Chaos Orb on the land that D plays out now. And there we see a Volcanic Island. A Mox Pearl. Tapping both. Is he going to cast? There's a time walk as well. That's really funny. I wonder if he's going to use... Yeah, he's going to use Chaos Orb in response. I think this is a good decision. Oh, really funny to see both players here casting time walk in their opening turn. And now we're going to see a flip here by Stebo. Is he going to hit it? That's the question. 
I love seeing all these different techniques. By the way, everybody flips an orb differently. I think it's, it's such a great part of old school culture. Flipping the orb, that moment, what a player does, how they do it, it's just fantastic. I love it. And here we see a scrub land by De Jong. And a pass turn. Going back up to 20, of course. It's very nice of you, Stevo, putting your opponent's life total back on 20, where it should be at the start of the game. And there we see another land, another Tundra. Is he going to cast something here? Savannah line, Surrender Pafrit, it's all possible. An attack could always be done. He is attacking here, so again, kind of taking that risk of finding a disenchant. This time he doesn't. So we see the life drop there to 18, playing a Mox Jet and a pass turn. So for D, this is kind of nice that at least there's no creature on board. Playing a Plateau. Looking at his hand, could he be, you know, contemplating about playing a Setch Troll? I don't think so. Why would he? Now he could, of course. Black Lotus. Sarah Angel could be an option now. I mean, with the Black Lotus, you've got a lot of options all of a sudden. Or are we going to see a big Brain Geyser? Oh, we are going to see the Setch Troll. Are we going to see some kind of counter spell here by Stevo? There we see him using the Black Lotus for another Setch Troll. He is taking a big risk here. Putting two Setch Trolls on the board. Okay, there's the first Side Blast taking care of one of them. Wow. So, D is really putting on the pressure here, trying to at least, but there's a chain, so this is kind of backfiring on him. He took the risk, and now he's lost both of the Setch Trolls and also taking two damage now from the factory. And yeah, this is, this is great for Stebo. This is a great scenario. I mean, what if he wouldn't have had the answers, then he would have been in trouble. One card in hand now, by the way, for Brother Stebo, and I believe three cards in hand there for D. Tapping two, there is a Chaos Orb. And he is gonna flip the orb on the factory. Let's see how Dion flips, let's have a look. So it's a different technique, but also a hit. Both players very experienced. And there goes the factory. I mean, I think if you're Stebo, you're kind of in a way happy that he uses his Chaos Orb to get rid of the factory. That's pretty good value. There we see a City of Brass. Both players pretty high up in life, by the way. Stebo on 18, Dion still on 16. And of course, uh, D is having some, uh, some mana issues here. Does he have a land drop? He does in, uh, with the Volcanic Island. Tapping three. Are we going to see another Setch Troll? Another one. Setch Troll number three. Finding its way to the board here. And now he has that Scrubland open to regenerate. So direct damage is not going to work anymore. Here we see another Mishra's Factory. And D can just swing in here, of course. So he can deal three points of damage. Stebo dropping to 15. And there's a Savannah Lines. And this is quite nice because... You know, that Savannah Lines kind of preventing Stebo from attacking with his own factory, and he probably also wants to keep the factory untapped to potentially block the Savannah Lines. So Savannah Lines is doing quite a lot in this scenario. There we see the attack again by the Setch. Exactly, he's just going to take the damage, and this is super annoying for Stebo, because how can he get rid of that Setch troll? I wonder if he boarded in his Swords to Plowshares. Because, of course, Swords is a great weapon against the Setch Troll. I also wonder if D boarded in his uh, Terrors against those Surrender Befreeds. Three cards in hand here for D. I mean, you know, D can also say, you know, I don't really need Terror because Cyblast can take care of the Surrender, and I've got four of those. And, of course, the downside of Terror is you cannot play it on the Mishra's uh, factories. Attacking with both here, quite interesting, indicating probably that he's got a Disenchant or a Bolt. So there we see the animation. I'm expecting a Bolt here, or a Disenchant, before blockers are declared. Exactly, because that way he can deal five points of damage here. He's going to drop to seven. Ooh, this is looking bad for Brother Sebo. Already down a game. Is he going to lose this? Two to nothing. There we see another Savannah Alliance. 
Stebo needs, what he needs here is a balance. And I'm, I'm kind of impressed again by these deck. When I saw the deck photo of Brother Stebo, I thought, okay, this is going to be a very close uh, matchup. But, I mean, D is really winning this. There we see a Surrender Profit. Okay, this is kind of good news for Brother Stebo. I wonder if D is he's going to attack with everything. Because if he is, then he can, you know, or... Stebo can block the Sedge and then he takes 4, drops to 3, or he can decide to kill a Lion, take 5, drop to 2. I would probably kill a Lion here because whether you are on, on 3 or on 2, it doesn't really matter anyway. And then at least you've killed a Lion. But I mean, I, either way, it's kind of like a catch-22. They're both, you know, bad decisions. There's not a good decision to make here. Of course, I don't know what Stebo's got in hand. Let's hope for him. He's got some kind of removal in hand still. Yeah, so he's blocking a lion here. Take five, go to two. That means that at least he needs another blocker if D isn't able to kill him on the spot. Yeah, he's not. So he's giving Stebo one more turn at least. Of course, taking damage from the Surrendip as well. Oh, there's a balance. That's quite interesting. It's, it's not going to help him though. Because he gets killed by his own... By his own surrender. There we see an attack first. And then we see a balance. Yeah, I think he's dead, right? Because balance is gonna... He's got one card in hand. Okay, they're still playing though. So maybe he's got some kind of weird way out of this. Yeah, he's gonna put those cities away. That makes sense. He's gonna pass turn. And that's it. Okay, that's it. I thought maybe, Stebo, you had some kind of weird card or idea in your head how to still survive this, but no. There was just too much pressure. I think this game two, you know, D found everything that he wanted to find here. And uh, that means it's a 2-0 a victory for the Corset deck. Uh, so great work here by D. Congratulations with the victory. And that was the episode for today. I hope you enjoyed the battle between these two giants. And uh, keep an eye on the channel because for the next episode, we've got round number five from this tournament. And it is a pretty cool one. We've got Alan who's playing Surrendip Lightning. Look at his deck, beautiful white bordered main 60. And uh, he is playing against a deck that I'm even more excited about. It's a deck piloted by Wilfred and it's called Meet the Flargies because it's got two goblins of the Flark. And both of these players are playing Iron Claw Orc. And uh, both of these decks are doing really well. They're still in it to win it. They can still make the top eight. So it's quite exciting to see decks with Iron Claw Orcs doing so well. But especially that Meet the Flargies deck, it's just, uh, it's hilarious, Bull Lightning. Uh, Goblins of the Flark, of course, but also Iron Claw Orcs. Uh, you know, we see uh, the, the the dragons here, Sheevan Dragon and Dragon Whelp. I mean, I, I like it. I love it. I'm really looking forward to showing you this match. And maybe it's nice to tell you guys that I don't know how this ended up as well. When the players play on the stream table, I was playing in this tournament as well. I always tell the players, please don't tell me the result. I don't want to know. Of course, I, I can I can look at it. I can, I can find it out if I want to, but I don't want to know. I want to be surprised just like you. So anyway, this is going to happen for the next episode. So keep an eye on the channel. If you're new to Timmy Talks, welcome. Please don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. And before you go, I'd like to ask you to like this video, comment on this video, and share this video on your socials. All these things are completely for free and they really help Timmy Talks move forward and they help me create the content um, that I make here for you guys. And talking about all that stuff, there's one more thing you can do. You can also support the channel financially by becoming a patron of the channel via Patreon. So here you can see um, a screenshot of my Patreon page. There's probably an info card appearing right now. If you click on that info card, you can visit the Patreon Timmy Talks site. And there you can find out how you can support me on Patreon. It already starts with just $1 a month. So it's quite cheap to support me and um that kind of sounds weird i mean support the channel uh and, and and you really help the channel moving forward you're allowing me to travel do these tournaments to show you the matches so hopefully you'll consider becoming a patron and the cool thing is if you do you can join the timmy talks discord you can join the timmy talks online events and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll how cool is that what end scroll well this end scroll
Ik het als fikker te somber gezien.